I'd like to share with you for a few moments this morning a message that I've simply titled, Mission Possible. How many remember the old television program? This goes way back into the late 60s, early 70s. So some of you in the room, you weren't even alive at that time. And you're saying, praise God, I wasn't. But nonetheless, how many remember the old program, Mission Impossible? Yeah. All right. And then they did a kind of a remake of it in the 90s and uh, even some that's more recent than that. But the title of it was, is Mission Impossible. Now this morning I want to talk about our mission. The mission that is God-given and that this mission is possible. And that we need to understand that God does not give us a mission that is going to be one of futility. But he's giving us a mission that is doable. Take your Bibles and turn through this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Gospel of John, chapter 20, starting with verse 19. We're coming in now into this time when Jesus has just been resurrected from the dead, and he's going out to meet his disciples. Listen to what it says. On the evening of that first day of the week, which is Sunday, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. He imagined seeing firsthand after the crucifixion and all these pictures so vivid yet in their minds to see the Lord alive and standing before him and showing the nail prints in his hands and the piercing wound in his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, the second time now, peace be with you. Now notice what he says. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. With the same commissioning that I came to this world on, this is the same commission that I'm sending you out on. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now go with me to Mark chapter 16 for a moment. In Mark chapter 16, looking at verses 15 and 16, it says, Then he told them, You are to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone everywhere. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved, but those who refuse to believe will be condemned. Now this passage, along with Matthew chapter 28, is often referred to as the Great Commission. These words are the final words Jesus spoke to his disciples just prior to his ascent back to heaven. Now for all practical purposes, these few words comprise what one might call his last will and testament for all of his followers that would follow him from that time on. However, it's far more than just a last will and testament. It is clearly an assignment. Our assignment as given is clear and it's very simple. We are to go everywhere and tell everyone that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by him. Now, I love the way the Bible records the disciples, how they respond so enthusiastically. Look at verse 19 of Mark 16, it says, When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at God's right hand. So where is Jesus at this moment? In heaven. Where? At the right hand of God the Father. And the disciples went everywhere preaching. And the Lord was with them and confirmed what they said by the miracles that followed their messages. Now, the early church was enormously successful in their impact upon the world and the culture of the world of their day. The Bible says they turned Jerusalem upside down. They did so by engaging men and women with the good news of Jesus Christ. From Jerusalem, the Bible says, they were to go to Judea. And then from Judea, they were to go to Samaria and from Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. And everywhere they went, they engaged the world. And they engaged in pushing back the curtain of paganism that existed at that time. 
They were so effective that historians tell us that by the year 100 AD, they had evangelized the then known world. Think about that. So within just, you know, a span of about 70 years from the time of the birth of Christ, approximately, they then had evangelized the then known world. Historians also tell us that Christians were engaged in every single facet of life. You can find Christians engaging in government, in education, in medicine, in law. They were the common laborers of every day. They were the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. They were involved in every realm of society. Many of them were persecuted. And the more they were persecuted, the more they engaged the culture around about them. When they were scattered, rather than becoming bitter, they engaged their new surroundings, and Christianity began to spread throughout Europe and that part of the world, throughout the Middle East, Far East, like wildfire. Sadly, however, the church over the years has moved from an offensive kind of posture to a defensive one. There was a moment in history where the church viewed itself, we are out to take back the territory that belongs to God. But as time went by, rather than being offensive, they became defensive. And it was circle the wagons, play it safe, don't rock the boat, let's be incognito, let's stay under the radar. Statistics, however, prove whenever and wherever the church engaged its mission, lives and families, villages and nations were transformed. Friends, I simply tell you this morning, the mission is possible. The mission is possible. You see, God the Father did not send his only begotten son on a mission that was doomed for failure. Nor did Jesus commission his followers, as we just read, to go out to do an impossible task. And we must never forget that the Great Commission is more than a commission. It is what we would say a commission. And every time you add the prefix co, it puts a brand new light on things. If I were to say co-pilots, or if I were to say co-managers, or co-laborers, throughout the week here as we're getting closer and closer to going back in, to our sanctuary, we've got scores of people that are working in all the disciplines. Some are working, you know, they're electricians, and there's plumbers, and there's carpenters, and there's carpet layers, and you name it, there's trades of all kinds. They're co-laboring together with one vision and one goal, and that is to finish this job and get us into the sanctuary again on November the 6th. Now, our mission spiritually is a joint mission. It is a mutual mission. It is a common mission. I want you to look at Mark 16, verse 20, once again. It says, and the disciples went everywhere preaching. Now, notice, they go out and they do what Jesus told them to do. They went to the mission, and the Lord was with them. You know, I'm so glad that when we're on mission for God, God is with us, amen? Amen. And the Bible says simply here, the Lord was with them. The Lord didn't say, well, lots of luck, you guys. Go on out and give it your best whack. Let's see what happens. He didn't say that at all, as you all know. He was engaged with them in the mission. It was a co-mission. It was a co-mission, a joint mission, a mutual mission. It was a common mission. And the Lord was with them and confirmed what they said by miracles that followed their messages. Now, for the next few moments, I want you to consider with me, first of all, God's passion for the mission. God's passion for the mission. You know, passion, we hear a lot about passion these days. Passion is described as a mindset that is permanently focused on what a person wants to achieve. That's passion. Their mind is singular set. It is one mind going in one direction. It is like a laser beam. They're after the mission. And so passion then is a mindset that is permanently focused and it's focused upon what they want to achieve in life. An individual's passion becomes very evident 
when we begin to talk to anybody in conversation. You can tell what they're really passionate about. You know, some people are passionate about politics. And this is certainly the season of politics in Wisconsin and throughout the nation. And they're passionate about it. You can tell there's, there's a, a fire in their bones as they talk about the particular candidate that they are wanting to win. Some are you know, very passionate about a project they're working on. You know, downtown Milwaukee, there's a, another skyscraper that's going up. And if you hear any of the engineers or anyone that's talking about that project, I mean, they're passionate about it. Or they're passionate about a product. When I think of being passionate about a product, I think of a young guy that came to our home one day. We were working in the garage, and the garage door was open, and he just kind of walked into the garage, and he was selling a spray cleaner. And so he said, I want to show you how well it works. And so he went over, and he squirted it on the wall, and he went like this. Now I've got a, a white polka dot in the middle of my garage wall. <laughs> then he went over to my refrigerator freezer well, that was out in the garage, kind of a secondary one, and he sprays it and puts a polka dot on it. So now I've got a white spot on the wall, a white spot in the middle of my refrigerator freezer. And at that time, we had a red boat that uh, we enjoyed out on lakes, you know, here in the nearby area. And, uh, and it needed a, a cleaning, and he saw that. And so he went over there and did the same thing to the side of my boat. Now I've got a red polka dot, two white polka dots. What are you going to do? but buy his product to finish the job. And then he said, and I want you to know, best of all, he said, because he saw we had small children at the time, he says, this is non-toxic. And he turned the bottle around, squirted it in his mouth. The same bottle that he'd been washing wall, boat, and refrigerator. He had the whitest teeth you've ever seen in your life. (laughs) Better than any dentist job could do. He was passionate about his product. Others are passionate about saving the planet and recycling. And every conversation, it just kind of, it drifts to the top. You can tell what's happening on the inside of an individual by what comes out of the mouth. The Bible says that the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. And when the heart is passionate about something, it comes out. So what is God passionate about? God is passionate about people. People that he created in his image, his likeness. A God that would care so much about individuals that he would say, I want you to be part of my family, not only for time, but for eternity. You know, I would say that nearly every verse in the Bible can be read with this context of the passion that God has for people. Try it out. Look at the scriptures. And as you're doing so, think of God's passion. And God's passion is for people. You know, from the fall of man, as recorded in Genesis chapter 3, God's passion has clearly been in every single generation to bring mankind back into relationship with himself. The Bible simply says that he is not willing that any should perish. No matter what they have done, though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Where sin abounds, the grace of God doth much more abound. And God is passionate about men and women not going to hell and being separated for eternity. Jesus, he modeled that passion all throughout his earthly ministry. You know, one of the first little pictures we have of Jesus in Scripture is that picture that he is 12 years of age. He is in Jerusalem. Parents have been there for the Passover Parents and the group from Nazareth, they leave the city of Jerusalem, heading back as would be a custom. They'd kind of go as a big gang. And they assumed that Jesus was with them. But Jesus was not to be found. And so they had to go all the way back to Jerusalem. And where did they find Jesus after three days of Jesus being AWOL? And you can imagine what parents are thinking because the city of Jerusalem would swell to over a million, million, million and a half individuals during Passover time. And what could have happened to our son during this time? And they find Jesus, you know where, they found him at the temple. And what is he doing? He's having a conversation with the doctors of the law. And the parents come, and the Bible says it really kind of soft. 
The Bible says, they came and said to Jesus, why have you dealt with us so? Let me tell you, I think that there was a little more than that. (laughs) And I believe that they gave him a royal chew out. And they were, you know, telling Jesus, we were worried sick and we ran all over the city. I've been in Jerusalem and I've lost somebody before. And I know what it's like running through the streets of Jerusalem, trying to find somebody that kind of, you know, got mixed up and uh, separated from the rest of the crowd. And uh, here we have Jesus, and he says to his parents, do you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now, at the age of 12, what were you saying at that time? Jesus says to his parents, do you not know that I must be about my father's business? The age of 12, the passion is growing. He says later on, I've come, I've been sent to seek and to save the lost. I've come to give my life as a ransom for many. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Now in John chapter 9 and verse 4, Jesus I want you to see that passion once again in this portion of Scripture in John chapter 9 and verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while his day. The night cometh when no man can work. I remember back when I was living in the parsonage in Wauwatosa when we were on staff at Calvary Assembly of God. I started painting one late fall day. And uh, after I painted the garage, which needed it desperately, I decided that, you know, all of the main, you know, uh, boards on the front of the, of the garage door, I would paint them in an accenting red, which would match the house. And I started, but it got so dark that I could not see what I was doing. And so I got about half of it done, and when I woke up in the morning, there was about six inches of snow. I never got back to the job until way, way late next summer. Jesus said, you're not going to be able to work all night. There is a night that's coming. There's going to be change in culture, change in nations, changes of law. There's going to be changes of the different kinds. They're going to try to stop this gospel from going forward. He said, so I must work the works of him that sent me while his day. The night is coming when I will not be able to finish what I really have in my heart to finish. Friends, let me ask you this morning, what are you passionate about? What is it that when you get up in the morning, it's the first thing you think of? What is the last thing you think of when you go to bed at night? Now, amongst a whole lot of other things, my grandchildren fit in that category. It seems like when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is chuckle about something they said or, you know, something that... You know, it's just, you know, a delight of this season of life. And before we go to bed at night, and of course we pray for all the family and pray for each and every one of them, but also just before going to sleep again, I begin to think of my wonderful seven grandchildren. Now why? Why is it we think of them? Why is it we think of our children? Why is it we think of these things? Because it's our passion. Jesus was passionate about people. God the Father, passionate about people. So the parameter of the mission, how big is this mission? If we're to go out and we are to make disciples, where are we to do this? To what extent, to where, where do we have to go? Is it only to the people that we like, that are much like us, Or is it that we are sent to people that sometimes will really grade us the wrong way? They have bombed our nation. They have killed our sailors at sea. They have bombed cities of the world into the the Stone Age almost. They cry out, death to America. What is the dimensions? What is the parameters of this mission that God has sent us to. I want you to look at John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, because I believe it's very succinct here what God expects. Listen what it says. And I want you, when, when I pause, I want you to 
identify with me what is the borders of this mission, the parameters of the mission. For the Lord God, or for God so loved the what? Say it, church. That he gave his only begotten son that? Believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the? To condemn the? But that the? Might be what? Might be saved. Notice, it's the world. It's every nation. Just as Pastor Dan was saying a few moments ago, the longing of God's heart is that one day there's going to be a worship service like no worship service that ever has happened on planet Earth. Every tongue and nation and tribe is going to be represented. And we're going to sing together a song and a chorus that lifts high the blood of Jesus Christ that has redeemed us and that we're saved not by our works but by his marvelous work. Look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 and help me once again. Then he told them, you are to go into all the what? And preach the good news to everyone, everyone, everywhere. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses starting where? Jerusalem, Jerusalem that's home. And then into all Judea, which is the county round about them. And then to Samaria, which is Madison, Wisconsin. And then to the what? Ends of the earth. So we understand now, God is passionate about reaching men and women that are lost and will spend eternity without him, without divine intervention without the mercy of God, without salvation that is only found through Jesus Christ. Samaria. It is interesting that Samaria is, is, is kind of lifted out, kind of almost in, in a contextual way, so as to see that not only are you to go to this Jerusalem and Judea, but you should also go to Samaria. And why, why is Samaria so unique? Well, you see, Samaria, most Jews would avoid even passing through Samaria by traveling on the east side of the Jordan River, even though it was further and even out of the way. Samaria was part of the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah, they did not get along. That is obstacle number one. Obstacle number two with the Samaritans and with Samaria, the Samaritans intermarried during their Babylonian captivity of 70 years. Therefore, the Jews considered them to be half-breeds and didn't want anything to do with them. Obstacle number two, the Samaritans did not recognize the temple in Jerusalem. They had their own temple at Mount Gerizim, and they also had not only their own temple, they had their own altar, they had their own form of religion. When Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem for the cross, they wouldn't even allow him any time or place in the Samaritan cities because he was passing through and going to Jerusalem. And you're one of those Jerusalem Jews. That's who you are. And so there was division. There was between the Jews and the Samaritans this great gap. So in short, this divide between the Jews and the Samaritans was racial. They considered them half-breeds. It was political. They had their own political system in the north, and they had their own religious system. Now, friends, what I find interesting here is that Jesus, he broke all of these barriers by ministering to a Samaritan woman by the well. Let me ask you, what is your parameter for the gospel? Is there any racial group that you leave out? Is there any political group you'd leave out? Is there any religious group? You'd say they're too far gone. There's no reason to even bother with them. I think of the story of Ralph Bell. Ralph Bell was one of the associate evangelists with Billy Graham for many years. 
and he was on his way into the Philippines to do a crusade. And as the plane was flying into the Philippines and uh, about to land, he said he was looking out the window and looking down at the islands. And, and for those of you that know anything about that, that region, it's made up of thousands of islands. It's not just one landmass like the continental United States, but it's made up of, of thousands of islands. He said, I looked out the window as we were flying into Manila, and he said, I looked down. He said, what I saw was a little island, and on this island was just about three, four, maybe five small hut-looking houses. He said, that's a very insignificant little island. Only five families live there. And God said, would that be an insignificant island if you live there? Would that be an insignificant island if your mother or your father lived there? God's passionate about people. And the parameters of the mission is to go everywhere and tell everyone that Jesus Christ loves them. Jesus died on the cross for them. Their lives can be forever different because of Christ. I'm going to pause in your mind for a moment and transition to the power for the mission. Look at John chapter 20, verses 21 through 22. 21, the last part of the verse says this. As the Father hath sent me, I am sending you. I want you to notice that. He said, with the same mission and the same commissioning, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. We need to understand, church, we have been commissioned in the same way that Jesus was commissioned by his Father when he left heaven above to come to this earth on a mission to seek and to save the lost. That was his passion. You know, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. Was there a need, an overwhelming need? Yes. Was there a thousand of the reasons why God could have, have justified mankind's need for salvation? Yes, it was. But the impetus behind sending his son was the fact that he loved the world so much that he did not want anyone, anywhere, at any time, any season, to go to hell. As the Father has sent me, Jesus said, I'm sending you. Now look at verse 22, because sometimes we stop there at verse 21. These two are welded together as one thought. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts 1 and verse 8. We'll tie this all together now. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Notice you're going to receive power, and this power is going to uniquely come when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Our mission is impossible if we foolishly attempt to accomplish it in our own strength and our own wisdom. Remember now, the mission is a co-mission. Once again, verse 20 of Mark 16. And the and they disciples went everywhere preaching, and the Lord was with them. Aren't you glad to know that wherever you go, the Lord goes with you? Now, I've been told that if we speed, he gets out of the car. You're on your own at that point. Somebody else said, I'm with you. Lo, I'm with you always. That Jesus don't fly. You'll get it later. <laughs> but you're worth waiting for. All right. The Lord was with them. Where was the Lord at this time? The right hand of God the Father, right? But where is he at? He's in the heart of the mission. He's passionate about the mission. He is not allowing either political, racial, or religious division to separate these people from 
the love of God. Our mission is to participate with God who is passionate about people. So we've talked about God's passion. His passion is for people. The parameter of the borders of where we're to go is what? The world. And we're to do this in the power of the Holy Spirit. But what about provision? So we, we understand the passion, the parameters, the power of the Holy Spirit, but what about the provision to get this job done? Friends, I would simply say this morning that when you become passionate about what God is passionate about, God takes note and begins to flow heaven's resources through you. A partnership with God is the very heart of what we're talking about this morning in our faith promises. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 17 says this. This is the Apostle Paul now. He's writing to the church of Philippi. And what he's saying to them is, not that I desire your gifts. He said, it's not, it's not about money. He says, what I desire is more to be credited to your account. He said, I'm not just asking that you will send what is necessary to get the job done of sharing the gospel in this hour. He said, and you've sent gifts, he said, and I, I thank you for them. So he said, don't get this all confused. I'm not asking necessarily for more. What I'm asking for is that you might have more credited to your account. That phrase, credited to your account, is a phrase that has been borrowed from commercial banking, which was well established at this time. You realize that commercial banking goes all the way back to about 2000 BC. It was the Babylonians that were the ones that really refined this, this whole business of banking. And by the time that Paul is writing this, there are deposits, there are lending, there's changing of money. Banking is very well organized. Now here's what he is saying. He's saying, you have two accounts. Now I want you to understand, you have two accounts today. Most all of us here, we've got a bank account. And whatever amount's in it, I mean, that varies with every single one of us in the room. However, we all have, for the most part, some kind of a, an account. Now that account that we have, one day, we're gonna have to just let go of. We're not gonna take it with us. As much as you wanna grab a hold, there's a day when someone else will possess everything you have left on this earth. And let me tell you, if you've not met your family, you'll meet them then. They'll all come looking. They may have never said hello to you all life long, but now they find there's a little money left somewhere. They'll be there. That really bothered Solomon, as you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, he said, it just ticks me off thinking I've, I've worked so hard all life long and I've accrued all of this wealth and then someday some knucklehead of mine is going to have it all. And who knows what they'll do with it. They'll spend it foolishly. Paul is saying, you have two accounts. You've got one account that's down here on the earth. It might be with Chase Bank. It might be with a savings and loan. It may be, you know, uh, a 401k or a 403b or something of the like, but all of us in some realm for the most part, we've got some kind of account here. He said, but I want you to understand, you also have a spiritual account on the other side. And that account, he said, my desire is that you might have that account on the other side waiting for you that is filled with the blessings that God has put within that account for you because you are faithful here on this earth with the mission. Listen to what Jesus said specifically about that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth 
And he says, here's the reason for it. Where moth and vermin destroy. Now I would say, for many of us, we're not so worried about moth or vermin destroying what we've got in the bank. How many have heard the phrase inflation? So if you had $10,000 in the bank, at the beginning of this year, you've got about, uh, about 9,000 today. About 10% of it is gone. If you have saved and you've scraped and you put away a million dollars, you just lost a hundred thousand dollars this past year. So he says, don't lay up for yourself treasures only on this earth. Now the Bible is balanced. The Bible has, you know, words to tell us, you know, that we are responsible, you know, to, to pass on to the next generation and, and help them and, you know, all of that. So keep it all in context. But he says, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures where? Say it. Treasures where? Where moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now I think we can take that word heart and put another word in for it that we've already talked about. For where your treasure is, there will your what be? Your passion. Your passion will be there as well. God is passionate about people. For the whole world. Everyone, everywhere. He said, when you go out, you can only go out in the power of the Holy Spirit and accomplish what I expect you to accomplish. And that's for all of us, whether we are missionaries across the seas or our neighbor next door, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Why don't you bow your heads with him, please? Lord, I would ask that you would do what mere words cannot do. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us individually about the mission, about where our passion level is at this morning. what people we would exclude from the gospel because of either their religion, their, their race, or something else, their politics. Help us, Lord, I pray, to do as you did. You went to the woman at the well. You broke all of the the rules of engagement at that time. He went to one woman that was hurting, longing, needing help. Lord, we're so glad that your word declares that we don't have to do this in our own minds, in our own strength, with our own tactics, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that we would get it. There is a provision that is necessary and that you would allow us to be a part of the great commission, that we would release our faith and, and that you would back it up with all the resources of heaven. I pray, Lord, in these next few moments that we do will make a difference in our city, our state, our nation, and around the world through all of our missionary partners. I pray, oh God, your blessing to rest upon our minds 
as we hold the cards in our hands in these next few moments and to realize what we do will truly make a difference. Taking the gospel, fulfilling the great commission, the great commission, that you're not gonna just stay in the heavens and lots of luck, I hope you can pull it off, but you're gonna come alongside of us to make the impossible fully possible. Let's take the Faith Promise cards out for a moment. If you have not received the card, let me just ask you to wave your hand at me. If you have not received the card, you've not received it, ushers very quickly. We've got a row down here near the front, back over here to my left as well, down here to the front, over here on this side, the second row back over here. Just wave at them. I want to make sure you receive a copy. This card is our means and way of, of stating what, with God's help, we want to do on a monthly basis for missions above our tithe and our offerings that we normally are giving on a weekly basis. And it simply says this, 2223, my faith promise. With God's help, I commit to doing my part to reach our world for Christ by giving over and above my tithe and offerings. For each of the next 12 months, Discover Church can count on my monthly world impact investment of and a place to mark. Now, some of you are, you're veterans at this. You've, you've been down this road with me many, many times. And you know the march, you know how it goes. But for some of you, you may not have ever been part of a Faith Promise Sunday like this. This is a day that we set aside once a year for the purpose of determining what we're gonna do above our normal giving for the cause of Christ around the world. And I, I could go on and tell you story after story, testimony after testimony of how God views this moment as a faith moment. And it's not a pledge. Pledges, and you've all heard, you know, you make a pledge. A pledge is you look at your bank account and you say, well, I can afford this and therefore I do that. A faith promise says, I'm going to stretch my vision so that it's a godly vision. It sees beyond what I can normally even expect or believe I could do. And with God's help, and with God's co-help in the whole process, I'm gonna make a faith promise that I know that God's gonna help me fulfill. And in some cases, I've heard people that, I mean, they literally, they have found money. I've had others that got a wonderful raise at their job. And the stories would go on and on and on of all the various ways that God has, has provided. And we'll give an opportunity for that in some of the upcoming weeks for you to hear because you're gonna hear testimonies of what God has done as we have released our faith. So I'm asking you right now to do what I and my wife have done in the first service and a lot of others throughout this morning. Take and mark your card, if you would, please. Now, you'll notice there's two parts to it. This part is your part to take with you. The larger part, we're gonna have you respond with in just a moment. And so, I'm gonna ask our missionary families, would you come, please, stand here in the front. They're gonna have a basket, and uh, you'll be able to place your Faith Promise card in that basket this morning. And so, as you fill out your card, and then just, let me encourage you, come up, tear it, the section off, the larger section goes in the basket, the other section. Here's what we do with our second section. We keep that right with our checkbook. I mean, we are always wanting to make sure we mark off, we put a check each month, make sure that our commitment that we've made, that we've made good on. And so, take this moment, you need to talk, husband and wife, family, whatever, and then after you fill out your card, bring them up and drop them here in the front. And uh, we're going to just 
believe together for just a marvelous mission that God is going to help us make possible. So as you fill out your card, you can bring it, place it in the baskets.